Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be able today as part of our second panel on the geopolitics of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership here at the American Security Project uh, to be able to bring one of the leading voices in Europe uh, on trade here before you. Uh, Minister Lilian Plumen is the Minister of Trade and Development of the Government of the Netherlands. She is someone who brings to this position uh, many years of work on social issues. She has been very known in her career for work on women's issues and on development and women's issues. Uh, she started her own organization specializing in market research and innovation called the Plumen Projecten to work with uh, women's groups and commercial entities. Uh, she has worked on fundraising for women's initiatives, a wonderful organization called Mama Cash. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that. Ma Mama Cash is a wonderful, very catchy name. Uh, from 2001 to 2007, she worked for the development organization Cordaid as head of quality and strategy and as director of international programs, so going far beyond the Netherlands in that position. She entered politics in 2007 to 2012. She was the chair of her party, the Labor Party, and in 2012, when her party entered the governing coalition, she became Minister for Trade and Development, a position she has held since then. In that role, she coordinates her government's trade strategy with that of the European Commission. She helps transmit to Brussels the concerns of the people of the Netherlands, uh, both commercial concerns, citizen concerns, about the direction of trade policy. And she is a key uh, voice, <clears throat> sorry, private voice and advisor and public voice uh, for the new commissioner, Cecilia Malmstrom. Uh, we are very privileged to be able to have, uh, to be able to put directly in front of you, Minister Plumen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and good afternoon to all of you. I've been really looking forward uh, to this speech, but even more so to the conversation that we will have afterwards. Um, I'm sure that you uh, have some interesting questions and remarks for me to consider. Uh, it's an honor to be here to present the Netherlands view on uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. To understand our perspective, you, I would say, need to know what lies behind that perspective. We, the Netherlands, are a small country and most of our country lies below sea level. And the second of those two facts has traditionally meant that if one landowner failed to maintain his dikes, other landowners would drown as well. And the first fact, my country's small size, means that we have always had to work with others. We cannot rely on power and strength. We need common rules. So the need for cooperation, the need for rules is ingrained in our genes. And it's no accident that Hugo de Groot was born in the Netherlands. And I won't be exaggerating if I call him one of the greatest legal experts of all time. The founder of modern international law. The founder of international public law. And he was also, by the way, a major influence on the American Revolution. More on that later. More important in the present context is the fact that Hugo de Groot, or Hugo Grotius, his Latin name, also shaped current thinking on the law of the sea and free trade. In his book, Mare Liberum, or Free Sea, published in 1609, he was the first to formulate the concept of a global community. He felt that the sea should be freely accessible. This, of course, reflects the interest of a seafaring trading nation. And talking about a free sea, that reminds me of certain instances where the seas are still not free. I will not mention your Jones Act, but I did. Uh, but I would like you to reconsider your policies on maritime services like dredging and feedering. Because I believe the US is doing itself a disservice. The lack of healthy competition and the lack of a level playing field is costing your taxpayers dearly, in my view. For my country, I might add, open sea policies paid off handsomely. The 17th century, the century of Hugo Grotius, became the Netherlands' golden age. 
the law of the sea made possible the trade that enabled our small country to become one of the most prosperous and for a considerable period, even one of the most powerful countries in the world. That power has since waned and is now more in keeping with our geographical size. In relative terms, our prosperity has also declined, fortunately, because it means that other countries are increasingly successful in securing their rightful share of global prosperity. In absolute terms, however, the Netherlands is now prosperous, more prosperous than it's ever been. In other words, the Netherlands is better off than in the golden age, and the world as a whole is far better off than ever before. Our relative power and influence may have waned, but what has not waned is our understanding of the need for cooperation in the broadest sense. The government in which I'm a minister is evidence of this. It's a coalition of two parties that have traditionally been opponents, left-wing social democrats and right-wing liberals. The voters made us the largest parties, but only by joining forces did we have a majority. So we adopted the motto, building bridges, bridges across the waters. We are working together to radically reform the Netherlands. The right-wing liberals place the emphasis on the development of the individual, and we, social democrats, mainly focus on a sustainable and socially just system. We want to make progress, but we also want to leave no one behind. Everyone must be able to participate, and those unable to do so receive help. Our goal is not just economic growth, but inclusive economic growth. That, in a nutshell, and despite some crude generalizations, is the perspective from which the Netherlands views TTIP. The Netherlands has always sought a level playing field. This concept is simply a modern way of saying what Hugo Grotius already proposed with his general law of the sea. A small seafaring trading nation thrives on stability and predictability. And these can only be guaranteed through clear, mutually agreed laws and norms. And it's to this that we owe our prosperity. From an economic perspective, TTIP simply makes a lot of sense for both trading blocs. The EU and the US account for almost half of the world GDP and almost one third of world trade. Every day, $2.7 billion worth of goods and services go back and forth over the ocean employing 15 million people. Dutch trade and investment alone account for some 700,000 US jobs. And it's fair to presume that this number will rise as a result of TTIP. But apart from these economic motives, we also feel a moral duty to pursue these goals. We firmly believe in universal rights, equality, and in an inclusive global community. Or to paraphrase Hugo Grotius, Mundus Liber, a free world. These two Latin words followed, by, words followed by a question mark form the title of this speech. And I'll explain the reason for the question mark later. To us, TTIP is part of these efforts. But however far reaching it may be, we see TTIP also as a building block. Because in the long run, the inclusiveness that we are seeking is a much wider concept. Our ultimate aim is to build something that spans the entire globe, a mundus liber. But the World Trade Organization's Doha round of negotiations shows that we need to proceed step by step, one step at a time. The EU and the US, already close partners, have the responsibility and the clout to take the fir that first step together and to show the world the, the way forward. So, TTIP is an important step towards a more distant goal. Our efforts to take governance to a higher level should not stop with the EU and the US and should not just cover the economy. No country must be excluded, both as a matter of principle and as a matter of common sense. Because we all need each other. We believe that convergence, not confrontation, between power blocks will prove the best way to shape the 21st century. So, TTIP is not just another trade agreement. It would be a world first if the, US and the, uh, if the EU and the US reached agreement on a wide array of basic norms and standards 
ranging from state-owned enterprises and intellectual property to investment and consumer safety. It would be another first if we then work together to uphold such standards globally. And in this sense, TTIP can embody basic values shared across the Atlantic and beyond. Its foundations are, the, are a product of democratic societies, rooted in respect for human rights and the rule of law. The US and the EU, EU are among the first to include basic labor, environmental and consumer protection in their trade agreements. We boast two of the most sophisticated regulatory systems in the world. An agreement that commits both parties to uphold such principles would be a powerful tool for advancing these standards globally. But we don't agree on everything. There are fundamental differences of opinion between Americans and Europeans. On food safety, for example. What is safe and admissible and what is not? In Europe, your chlorinated chicken currently symbolizes this difference of opinion. People simply don't trust it. And I understand that in this continent, there is some anxiety about our cheeses. And that's both trivial and fundamental at the same time. Let me invoke the ideas of John Locke. I'm well aware, by the way, that Locke was English and also belongs to you, since he laid the foundations for your democracy. But he lived and he worked in the Netherlands for quite some time. He was an exceptionally bright student of Hugo Grotius, and he had a major influence on our constitutional system. Anyway, John Locke, whether he's yours or ours, he was the first to emphasize that the government is merely given a mandate by the people. Sovereignty ultimately lies with the people. Governments should always handle that sovereignty with utmost care. Locke, like Hugo Grotius, was a staunch advocate of free trade. Transporting ideas over many centuries to current situations is always a bit hazardous, but I do choose to interpret Locke's remarks on sovereignty as follows. We must always strike a balance between Hugo de Groot's dream of freedom and Locke's respect for popular sovereignty, the national legislation that expresses it, and the government's duty to protect the popular will and the law. In the context of TTIP, I'd like to mention two concrete elements that impact on sovereignty and government, government's freedom to act. First, the regulatory cooperation body. It's a part of TTIP that has yet to attract a great deal of interest, but I am sure that it will be a subject of intense debate in due course, and with good reason, because this body is intended to ensure that after an agreement to remove trade barriers, no new unnecessary barriers are erected in the future, which is a laudable aim. Nobody wants, say, two different kinds of charging stations for electric vehicles. But this kind of body is desirable only if its scope remains for expressing differences of opinion. That assessment is always a political one, and it can never le be left to the technocrats, let alone to businesses. Plans for a regulatory cooperation body are still in their infancy. Almost all of the details still have to be worked out in the negotiations. But that doesn't mean I'm content to wait and see. A body like that has to be subject to strict conditions. We can't have a situation where companies seeking to export certain products to Europe uh, use it as a way of circumventing the EU's stringent authorizations procedures or the other way around. In other words, if I have my way, the regulatory cooperation body will not have the power to meddle with legislation. Democratic procedure must remain intact. The EU and the US must retain the freedom to set their own policies to protect the public interest on the environment, on healthcare, and other issues. Locke would talk in terms of respecting the will of the people. And our coalition agreement talks about measures that safeguard a solid and sustainable future for all. Another part of TTIP, the investor to state dispute settlement, has certainly already attracted great interest, I believe also here in the States. Investor protection as such seeks to protect foreign business investments against discrimination by host governments as a means to safeguard the due process of law and also as a chance to devise a better global standard. 
But here too we must proceed with utmost care, as Locke already noted. We cannot permit companies to exert pressure on democratic decision-making by threatening to pursue claims running into billions. I want to guarantee that dispute settlement and arbitration mechanisms are not open to abuse. And this is why I, together with social democratic colleagues in the EU, proposed improvements along the following four lines. First, limit access to ISDS. Abuse of this mechanism, frivolous claims, must be ruled out. And only businesses which conduct substantial economic activities should be able to use it. As things stand, businesses can use a shell corporation in the Netherlands to institute a claim against another state. This practice must be stopped. Second, the policy freedom of governments must be safeguarded. We cannot allow a situation in which governments cannot carry out their policies for fear of facing large claims. Third, current investment protection standards must be made clearer and more limited. The practice, the practice known as foreign shopping must be prevented. Businesses will therefore have to make a clear choice about where they wish to have a dispute heard, rather than shopping around endlessly when a court decision is not to their liking. And fourth and finally, arbitration procedures must be improved. They should be more transparent. There must be clear requirements concerning the quality and independence of the arbitrators. And we should look into the possibility for appeals. To sum up, the rules on investment protections must be tightened up and must be made clear so everyone knows where they stand. And this is, to my mind, entirely in keeping with the spirit of Hugo Grotius and the ideas he put forward 400 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, I spoke earlier about Hugo Grotius' dream of the freedom of the seas and the limits formulated by John Locke when he referred to the will of the people. We all feel that tension, and the Netherlands is no exception. Again, I stress that the open world advocated by Hugo Grotius has enabled the Netherlands to prosper. Our open, export-oriented economy has thrived on the back of the trade liberalization of recent decades. And the globalization of the past quarter of a century has largely been to our advantage. I say largely, because a number of important reservations have been expressed. There are concerns. People feel that while trade liberalization and globalization have created many undeniable winners, they have also created losers. In too many places, the race to prosperity has degenerated into a race to the bottom. Two years ago in Bangladesh, it claimed the lives of over 1,100 people at Rana Plaza's textile factory. And in both your country, as well as in the European Union, including my country, it has cost too many people their jobs or a slice of their income. The pace of change has been rapid. So rapid that many people, too many people, are already starting to lose faith in large international projects whose consequences they cannot take in. There are abuses, there's no denying that. And these abuses often stem directly from the way we have regulated or failed to regulate. I see TTIP as an opportunity to show the world that there's a better way. I'm not naive. Stiffer competition can harm weaker competitors. Sometimes that can't be avoided if society as a whole can move forward. But when we can, we should, often, we should soften the blow of globalization and trade liberalization and look for alternatives for those who pull the short straw. You have your system of trade adjustment assistance. The EU has its own systems, such as the European Social Fund and the Cohesion Fund. Back at home, I'm calling for these systems to be made stronger. I want to be, make, I want to be sure that when people fall by the wayside, we can help them back on their feet. As I said, the Dutch government wants to move forward, but the goal must always be a solid, sustainable and socially just system. In this same vein, I'm working to protect the interests of third countries, especially developing countries. Harmonizing standards and legislation will have benefits. It will be a relief for them to abolish the absurd situation of an African farmer with two fields, one of which complies with US legislation and the other with the EU legislation. 
we need to maximize such benefits and limit the negative consequences. On balance, a fair, well thought out TTIP can do that. At the start, I talked about the Dutch tradition of cooperation and policy making by consensus. It's what we call the Polder model. One of its manifestations is the Social and Economic Council. It's a typically Dutch phenomenon. A consultative body bringing together representatives of employers and employees. It's one of the Dutch government's most important advisory bodies. Entirely in the spirit of that Polder model, our system of cooperation and consultation, I'll be seeking the Social and Economic Council advice on TTIP. I wanted to assess what TTIP would entail for employment standards in the Netherlands. There's great concern about the fact that the US has not ratified all the core conventions of the International Labour Organization. And I've asked the Social and Economic Council to examine what impact this will have and what alternative ways could be found to create a level playing field. And then we Dutch will consult, as we have been doing for hundreds of years. It can take a while. It's not always clear to outsiders what's happening at any given moment, hence my quite lengthy explanation. But it's the Dutch way of working towards a good, fair and balanced trade agreement, acting on the basis of both Dutch traditions and the current Dutch coalition agreement. Standing on the shoulders of giants like Hugo Grotius and John Locke, we can see far into the distance, beyond TTIP, to even more extensive international cooperation, the Mundus Liber, which is still on the horizon. But let's take it one step at a time. And at every step, we should look around us and behind us. Is everyone still with us? The people in whose name we are doing this? The people for whom we are doing this? Everything depends on that. Everything must depend on that. Hence the question mark after the title of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, uh, the minister has been kind enough to agree to take questions from the audience. Uh, we have a microphone in the back. If you have questions, please raise your hands and let us know. I, I might start off, uh, Minister Plumen, uh, by asking this. Um, you, you have served uh, as your country's trade minister since 2012, which means that you have collaborated with, the two, with two EU commission, trade commissioners, uh, Karl de Gucht, who although not a Dutchman, is a Flemish Belgian, shares many cultural characteristics. Well, the Belgian usually don't do that, but Karl de Geurt does, I yeah. have to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then with Cecilia Malmström from Sweden, yeah. who brings a very different perspective to, uh, uh, to how to bring the parties together on the European side. I wonder if you might comment a little bit on the ways in which those two have led the discussions on your side and also help we Americans understand uh, how the member states help shape, help shape trade policy in Brussels. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, comparing uh, two excellent people like Karel de Gucht and Cecilia Malmström is not, very, not so easy and it's also maybe uh, not totally fair because of the different phase of the TTIP negotiations mm. that they have been involved with. I think uh, Karel de Gucht, to his credit, um, uh, was very keen on starting the negotiations, very keen on working with the member states to come up with a mandate uh, for negotiations that would be uh, comprehensive uh, in a way that would also not only look at the traditional way that we look at free trade agreements, uh, reducing uh, tariff barriers, but also including non-tariff barriers. Uh, and Cecilia Malmström obviously uh, stepped in uh, last fall at a point in time where uh, part of the parameters of the negotiations have already been set, but also at a point in time where more and more concerns were being voiced by the member states and by the people uh, in, in the EU. Um, so, um, and I'm, I'm quite uh, happy, I would say, with both their perspective on what um, 
uh, how important uh, this uh, trade agreement is to both the EU uh, as well as to the US. Um, Cecilia Malmström uh, has been very clear on uh, the importance of making as many documents as transparent as possible. Uh, so let me then also use uh, this opportunity to call again on uh, the US government and also uh, on my friend Mike Froman uh, to um, uh, open up more uh, on the documents uh, because uh, we we do understand that if you're not able to, that you're not able to present documents to us that you're not uh, presenting uh, to your own uh, uh, house and uh, uh, your parliamentarians, but I would say uh, take the best of both worlds and open up because many people are getting very concerned because they just don't know what's on the table and we try to be as transparent as possible. So uh, and then the dynamics between the Commission and the member states. Well, obviously, uh, the description of that dyna dynamics really differs from, uh, from who you are asking. So uh, probably Cecilia would be very elegant about it. Uh, so I'll be very elegant about it too, although we Dutch are quite direct. Um, there is, uh, it's an interesting mix, I would say, of a very well understood um, uh, togetherness uh, and a joint uh, mission and a joint approach. Uh, but there's also sometimes difference of opinion between the member states and the commission. Uh, because as a member state, of course, I feel responsible for the 28. But I also, and I should be, I feel very, very responsible for the 16 million people in my own country. Now, to balance those two interests and to also make sure that the commission balances those different interests um, sometimes makes up for, for very strong debates. The other um, uh, dimension, I would say, in, in those, dimen uh, is in those um, dynamics is that um, the as a national government, I talk to my parliament about TTIP and, and trade policy, um, well, probably once in six weeks. And I give talks and I talk to people and I listen to the concerns and, you know, people will approach me uh, in the streets. So it's a very direct confrontation, if you wish, with the concerns that people have. I talk to businesses, consumer organizations, NGOs. Um, and maybe for the commission, um, they, uh, they are a little bit more uh, part of the Brussels arena. Uh, and, and they should be, because that's also a role that needs to be played. But there, of course, there's different uh, dynamics too. Uh, within uh, the 28 member states, I mean, all of us, we, share, we really cherish our national identity and national uh, priorities, but uh, we also uh, constantly look for common ground. Uh, the example that I gave on ISDS, uh, it's really good to see that there's colleagues among the 28 that share the concerns and that you can work with and then of course that makes the call also stronger to the commission. So it's, um, it's an interesting balance. Um, uh, sometimes it makes up for, well, kind of, you know, uh, really uh, strong debates. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think if there's any issue in trade policy that was ever important, it's TTIP. So uh, we should have a, a, a strong debate on well, it. Well, it's evident in those strong debates that the Dutch have a very eloquent spokesperson. Uh, we'll go to Thank this you. gentleman right here. If we have the uh, microphone. Thank you. We'll go to this gentleman here a second. Minister, uh, first of all, thanks to you for your excellent speech. Thank you for the... American Security pro uh, Project, always very interesting place to be. I happen to be an official of the European Parliament. We have an office here in Washington where we try uh, to liaise with the United States Congress because both the U.S. Congress and the European Parliament hopefully at some point will have to ratify the agreement. Uh, and since time is short and given the Dutch style for directness, let's just point out one thing and just underline it for our American friends. Common ground hardly exists uh, up the street on Capitol Hill where maybe this afternoon a bill on TPA will come out or maybe not, hopefully it will. But my question concerns the panel which you weren't able to sit in on unless you were listening uh, in the back room somewhere about the geopolitical arguments 
in favor of TTIP. Do you think it's uh, helpful uh, in terms of convincing a skeptical European public or members of your national European parliament to advance arguments that TTIP is not just a step towards a more ordered and legally based world, but also a message to Russia and to some extent China? Because these arguments are heard much more uh, I'm not saying they're wrong, but I hear them much more in uh, Washington than I do in Brussels. And finally, uh, very briefly, uh, in your national parliament, do you detect a sort of basic consensus in favor of TTIP in principle? Or as I read this morning that the French parliament had a meeting with Mrs. Malmstrom yesterday and they seem rather cool towards her. Uh, then a little word on the timetable. Mrs. Malmstrom has given a clear indication about the rest of the year. And again, thank you very much. Uh, when I get a copy of your speech, I'll make sure all my colleagues in Brussels and Washington read it. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, remarks and questions. Uh, let me touch upon them uh, briefly uh, so as to give others also an opportunity. Um, I, on the geopolitics, um, looking back at when um, the negotiations started and where we are now, I think the, the context of the geopolitics has changed very, very much. Uh, so it's not a matter of if it's a convincing argument, it's the reality that presents itself uh, to all of us. And um, I, as I said in my speech, I think a, a level playing field in terms of values and norms uh, is more than, I mean, it, it contains the chlorinated chicken, which we don't want, but it's also about much more. And in that sense, I think it could set a, a golden standard, hopefully. Um, on um, uh, the, uh, cons the way that the Dutch parliament is looking at TTIP, I think um, the, the debate is um, uh, gearing up in the Netherlands. Um, uh, in parliament, we've been discussing it for quite some time. Uh, my own party, the Social Democratic Party, uh, has been very strong, and uh, rightly so, I would say, on red lines uh, that they feel that should not be trespassed. Uh, those also are the red lines uh, that uh, the Dutch government uh, has, has put down, uh, and they're in terms of not lowering our standards uh, on food security, animal welfare, uh, and environmental uh, impact. Um, there's also a concern on, um, uh, on the uh, uh, ILO conventions, uh, like I mentioned. Uh, so um, I think Dutch Parliament uh, will make up its, mi its mind when uh, uh, along the way we are able to present uh, results of the negotiations. Um, and I am I'm, I'm sure that we will be able to uh, respect those red lines because we also uh, transfer them to the Commission. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth a strong debate and again I'm fully prepared to have that debate and also um, uh, make, make very transparent where we stand and that we don't want to trespass uh, those uh, red lines. Um, uh, and thank you for uh, 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 giving the speech to your colleagues in terms of um, where we are now. We are in favor of a good agreement uh, and of course it would be good if that doesn't take too long, but uh, quality is, is, is before timeliness, I would say. So, but we hope, uh, we'll see what happens this afternoon. Yeah. And what that will do to us. Yeah, we're, we're excited to see what happens yeah. this afternoon also. This gentleman here and then the gentleman over here. Minister Dewey, uh, and thanks for being here. I wonder if you could tell us, in a, preferably in a direct frank, blunt, Dutch way, astrobelieft, um, whether you share two strong impressions that have come out of my own research on the European side of the TTIP negotiations. One is that there has been a distinct cooling of enthusiasm for TTIP in Germany, which is the only country in the European Union besides Austria and Luxembourg where we don't find a majority or even a plurality public support for TTIP. Relatedly, I've noted a distinct cooling of enthusiasm for TTIP on the part of Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, partly because of a cooling for enthusiasm for TTIP in Berlin, but also because he's not sure he wants to spend valuable political capital trying to convince the European Parliament, where there's a lot of skepticism about TTIP, that a good TTIP is worth fighting for. Thank you, Valerie. 
Thank you. Your Dutch is excellent. <laughs> um, a cooling enthusiasm in Germany. Well, one only has to uh, read the papers uh, to see that uh, many citizens in Germany are quite concerned about uh, some of the impacts they fear that TTIP can bring. Uh, and um, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, uh, the leader of the Social Democrats and also uh, the vice uh, prime minister of, uh, of the current uh, German government has been quite clear, at least to my mind, quite clear on where uh, the German government sees red lines and they kind of resemble ours. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if I would, I mean, I would say that because of uh, the public debate, more and more people are looking into what is this TTIP and what does it mean to me? And I find it only well, natural, so to say, that concerns come up. But we, ha we have to address them, and I think uh, Sigmar Gabriel is, is doing that. Uh, then on Mr. Juncker, well, actually, uh, Brussels is a place where uh, a lot of rumors and uh, conversations are going on, and you never know what, um, uh, what is true and what's not uh, if you're not there all the time. That, at least that's what I say. So... Uh, I hear stories about Mr. Juncker being very enthused about TTIP, uh, but I also hear what you are saying, that he might not be. Um, I, um, I don't know, because I haven't spoken to him about it. Uh, I did speak uh, to uh, Frans Timmermans, who is the commissioner, uh, the, 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 the vice president of the commission, and also Dutch. Uh, and in him, I, uh, I haven't seen any change in his strong support for a TTIP along the lines that I described. So um, uh, that's where we are heading, um, and um, I, I would say that also in the European Parliament, this is, this is uh, par excellence a, a good uh, issue to debate upon, because it's about geopolitics, it's about how can we achieve sustainable economic growth, not only through TTIP, but it's, it's part of a strategy, and also how can we use um, it, this common agreement um, to, uh, to strengthen standards and, and norms and values that we believe in. So it's really worth the debate. Yeah. Thank you. This gentleman over here. We are Middag, Minister. Uh, my name is Thomas. All Lambert. of you speak Dutch. Yes, yeah. we do. Good Middag. <laughs> I'm with uh, the Belgian Embassy and, uh, by the way, uh, also a former assistant to Karel de Gucht. There you are. I can we have a mutual friend. Karel, he's not, uh, he's not uh, the only cooperative Belgian on the train. <laughs> <laughs> um, this being said, that is not my point. Uh, my question relates to um, the uh, economic situation in Europe. Yeah. With us uh, coming out of the, of the big recession. And uh, the, the specific question is, to what extent do you think uh, TTIP uh, is, is, would be part of a recovery strategy? Is it a trade round coming uh, a little too late for it, or does it hold, uh, still hold any relevance uh, for that? Thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Um, I think uh, TTIP, um, to my mind, TTIP is part of a uh, uh, inclusive economic growth strategy of the EU. It's not the only part of it, though. I mean, it's not that TTIP will change uh, the dynamics of the European uh, economy. Uh, but we're also not only negotiating about TTIP. Um, we've been negotiating with the Canadians uh, on uh, uh, CETA, uh, an, another agreement. We're negotiating uh, with the Japanese and with others. Uh, we just uh, concluded uh, the EPAS, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreements with uh, countries and regions in Africa. So I think free trade as such uh, should be part of this sustainable and inclusive growth strategy. And obviously, when coming out of the crisis, you uh, want growth and you want it now. And we all, but we also know that that is uh, uh, not realistic because TTIP, it will take some time before we come to closure. And then it will take some time uh, for us to really reap the benefits. Because in, in the first years, um, uh, there will be some transitional problems in some sectors. Uh, and this is also why I'm talking to the trade unions to kind of identify what sectors could that be and what kind of, re what kind of measures should we take uh, to uh, make sure that that transition is a smooth one. So I think the benefits uh, will come only a little bit later. Uh, but even, I mean, we will need 
sustainable economic growth, not only in 2015 and 16, but also in 2020 and in 2030. I'm also here because of the spring meetings of the World Bank. Uh, they will start tomorrow. And there, our goal is to uh, do away with extreme poverty in 2030, in one generation. We can do it. And also for that, uh, to reach that goal, we need in the EU and in the US, we need sustainable, inclusive economic growth. Because it's not only to the benefit of us and the workers in our economic zones, but for the globe, I would suggest. We'll go to the gentleman here. We've got probably time for one question after that one. Uh, hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my name is Dave Thomas. I'm a reporter with Inside US Trade. Unlike the previous speakers, I don't speak Dutch. <laughs> uh, uh, given what you're seeing uh, about the trade debate in Washington this week, uh, do you believe it's feasible for the US and the EU to reach a political agreement on TTIP by early 2016, as some people have said? I've heard some pe uh, we've reported that uh, some people believe that congressional passage of TTIP is probably not likely under the Obama administration and perhaps under a future uh, presidential administration. I was just hoping to get your thoughts about the timing of concluding a TTIP and, and what does that look like? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is one of the, the questions that is not so easy to be answered because like in Brussels, there's also a lot of talk going on in Washington. So some people will say uh, this would be... Um, uh, a, a key deliverable for the Obama administrations. Others would say uh, with um, uh, the majorities uh, as they are now, that will never happen. Uh, all kinds of scenarios uh, are going around on your uh, side of the ocean. On our side of the ocean, I think we have a new commission since the fall. Uh, we're totally geared up uh, to make it happen. Uh, but as I said, um, we prefer to take a little bit longer if that makes for a better agreement. And better would be fair and balanced and respecting the red lines that are already mentioned. So um, I'm, I'm not in a hurry, so to say, but I'm well aware that it would be good uh, uh, after, you know, there's been a lot of technical talks to also now start a political debate. Our last question. This gentleman here in the front row. Good afternoon. Charles Newstead, State Department. But just speaking for myself, not the department. Your goal of eliminating abject poverty throughout the world is very noble. But I wonder what your judgment is on the consensus of the members of the uh, IMF and so on, as to whether they're really willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary to do this, and how realistic is this goal? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, um, let me take the opportunity to once again uh, call on the United States of America to work with us on um, the modernization of the IMF and to make sure that emerging economies uh, uh, throughout the world also have a place and a voice at the table. I think if the United States uh, would follow that very sensible suggestion, not only done by myself, but by many others, I think the geopolitical impact of that would be, uh, would be very, very um, uh, long-standing and would be very important. Having said that, uh, yeah, I do think, um, look, if, if you want this new global agenda, if we are going to adopt it, uh, uh, and we probably will in September uh, in New York, uh, then of course adopting that agenda, uh, one also needs uh, to, p we need to put our money where our mouth is. And um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we will come up with um, financing for that development, but not only through traditional ODA. Um, we also need more domestic resource mobilization, including fairer tax policies in our own countries. The Netherlands has now is in the process of renegotiating all our tax treaties with developing countries to add a anti-abuse clause, for example. Now, this is also an example that I would suggest others can follow. Uh, we need the private sector uh, to step in. We need more blended finance. So we need 
innovation uh, to make that agenda happen. Uh, looking back at what happened in the past 15 years with the Millennium Development Goals, uh, not all of those goals have been reached, but some have. And um, uh, if we would have done a poll 15 years ago, I think the majority of us would not have thought that that would happen. So, yes, I think uh, uh, it can, we can do that in 2030, and I certainly hope you will be there to witness that. Uh, Minister Pluman, there's, a, there's an old line that goes something like this. What do you call someone who speaks four languages, a German what do you call someone who speaks seven languages, a Dutchman? What do you call someone who speaks one language, an American? <laughs> Thank you for using one of your seven languages to help Thank us you. understand in our one and for coming here this afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.